all semester long, we've been writing and using accumulation functions, right? You know how fast something is changing at every moment. You want to know how much you have at every moment. And so we've been looking at all these different uh, situations where we had the rate of change, and we are creating an accumulation function. But all those accumulation functions we wrote in open form, right? Open form. We wrote, we define those functions in open form, meaning using an integral. And that integral, the open form means it reflects that process, right? That process of, of accumulating bits of change, right? Accumulating bits of change and then uh, taking those out to whatever x value you were interested in. Okay, but then we said that it's nice that it reflects that process, the, all the underlying meaning, but it's not convenient for computing the values. So we said we use the fundamental theorem. If we have the fundamental theorem, then we can use the fundamental theorem to write these open form accumulation functions in closed form. And closed form is very convenient for rapid fire results, right? So you want to know how much accumulation you have at x equals 5. Boom, that's it's really easy because you have a nice basic function or combination of elementary functions like polynomials and, and sine functions and exponential functions. Okay, so, so the next couple of weeks we're going to be working on different techniques for antiderivatives. Antiderivative is the key to taking an integral and writing it in a closed form. So you had some practice. And the whole point of antiderivative, the, the point of this homework was to get you in the frame, the frame of mind of you're looking at a function and you're asking what function has the derivative of this one I'm looking at, right? So what function, if I took the derivative of it, would I get this thing? That's what we want to think of as antiderivative. We don't want to learn, like, so we're going to learn techniques, but we, we want to, all those techniques are going to be grounded in all the derivative rules you already know, but just thinking backwards. Rather than learning a whole new set of rules and for, forgetting all that derivative stuff, like the mastery test you did in Calc 1, we want to uh, take advantage of the thought process of those, all those rules you already know, and then we just kind of kind of think in reverse. Undo it, right? Undo it. Okay, so the first, um, first of these is uh, we started on Friday. It's called undoing the chain rule. So this will always be the first thing we look for, okay? Because it's, it's, this is probably the most common when we come to uh, open form integrals expressions. Most, lots and lots of, maybe more than 50% of the time, what we're looking at is the result of a chain rule derivative. And so that we always ask this question first. Is it, is, was this, this rate function, was it the result of a chain rule? And if so, we want to think about the chain rule and undoing it. Undoing it to recover the original function. Okay? So, I'm going to, uh, so let's just talk through that. So what does the chain rule say? That if you have a, a composite function, g of f of x, what is the derivative of that? What do we do first? g prime, and what do we do with the f? Is it g prime of f prime? No, so that's a really common mistake students make, especially when they get complicated. They'll do g prime of f prime. But that's not it, right? The chain rule is g prime of f, and here's where the chain comes in, then times f prime, okay? So you gotta be we gotta know that cold if we're gonna be able to undo it. So then for antiderivative in the case, we're gonna be gonna given something like g prime f times f prime, and we need to recover this original function g of f. And so we talked about last time. What are you gonna focus on in the rate function to recover the amount function? Are you going to focus on the way I have it written here? Exhibit A, is that going to help you to recover g of f of x or focus on exhibit B? A, look, you see it's almost the same thing. Exhibit A is almost the same thing as our answer. All we have to do is what? Just, we're going to look at that and all we have to do is, is you know, leave that inside function the same. Look at that external function, like the big picture function, and do what to it? Antiderivative, right? Leaving the inside as it is. Now there might be a little a factor mess that we have to clean up a little bit, but then that's most of the that's most of the problem. It's just identifying what the like outside function is, 
and doing the antiderivative of that outside function, again, leaving the inside function as it is, and then clean up the mess. Now, the great thing about antiderivatives is you don't have to get it perfectly on the first guess. What can you do? You, you can just write something down that you think is close, and then what can you do? Take the derivative, because that this is the whole point. The whole point is we're looking for the function whose derivative is the one we have. So take the derivative of your guess. So you don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect on the first try. Take the derivative, and then if you get exactly the function you, you started with, then you're done. You got it. If you get something a little different, then you're going to use that, compare them. Use, use how they're different to uh, adjust for your second attempt. <coughs> So we're going to focus on that, and that's going to get us, like we said, antiderivative of g is going to get, g prime will get us g of f of x. So the approach will be, write the antiderivative of the exterior function, g prime, keeping the anterior, anterior function f as it is. Check it by taking the derivative, and then we'll have to, maybe there might be a little mess, we'll have to clean up, like a factor or something that we have to take care of. <coughs> So I'm, I'm kind of giving you a little structure to it, but the goal is that when you do this enough time, you don't really need this structure. It's just going to start to see it. You're just going to start to look at it and just kind of write down the answer and then do a quick check and do it. So I'm going to give you a little structure, but I don't, all the while, our goal is to kind of uh, get good at just seeing it. And so we'll talk more about that. So here's just a review of that last scheme. So here's an example. I've got x cubed times 8 plus x to the fourth to the fifth. So first question we ask is, is this the result of a chain rule derivative? And how do we know? So the way that we know is comparing, we're looking for, the way that we know for sure is we would have some interior function of a composite function, and then we would have what? The derivative of it somewhere else in the expression. Do we have that? Where do you see that? So where do you see so this this thing here, g prime f of x? Is it exhibit A or is it exhibit B? G prime f of x. Is it x cubed or 8 plus x fourth to the fifth? This thing. And how can we make sure that that's right? The derivative of what's inside has to essentially be x cubed. Is the derivative of 8 plus x to the fourth essentially, you know, giving, given a factor? Yes, right? Because the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. So, and we have x cubed. That's all we need. All we need is the right power, right? Factors, we know with differentiation and integration. Factors just come along for the ride, so we can we can take care of those. All right, so yes, so we're going to have, uh, uh, since the derivative of x to the fourth is essentially x cubed, we got it. So what are we going to do? We said we're going to focus on the g prime f, and do what? Do the antiderivative of the big picture function of that, right, the, the external function of that. So what do we have? Something to the fifth, right? Something to the fifth. So what would I, what's our attempt? If we have something to the fifth, what's the antiderivative of something to the fifth? Something to the sixth. And we're going to keep it the same to the sixth. And also divide by six, right? So we said uh, something to the sixth, something to the fifth, the antiderivative <coughs> is that same thing to the sixth, but also one-sixth or divided by six. So we know this is at least close, all right? This is at least close, and what are we going to do? Check it, right? So we can check it by taking the derivative, right? Take the derivative and compare it to what we started with. So 6 times 1 sixth is 1 times 8 plus x to the fourth to the times 4x cubed. And we say, is that exactly the same as the function that we started with? No. How is it different? We have a 4 here that we don't have a 4 here. So how are we going to revise our attempt so we don't have the 4? 
we're going to need a one fourth, right? So if we if we if we take one fourth of our attempt, then when we do that check again, that four would be gone, and we'd have exactly what we started with. So we're, now our second attempt is going to be one fourth times one sixth times eight plus x to the fourth to the sixth. And we could, if you want to, you could do the check again, but it would check out now. <coughs> do the derivative. So then, we can simplify this as 1 24th, 8 plus x to the 4th to the 6th. Now, this is the kind of the first time this semester we've seen what an integral without <laughs> limits. So normally it's what? A. So since I have x is there, we'll do a to t. So normally it's something like that. <clears throat> and so what would that give us? So we'd have the antiderivative, and we'd, we'd plug in t. Okay, and so that would be this part. And then we'd have what? Minus that thing with a plugged in, right? When you have that thing with a plugged in, what what do you get? Do you get is that uh, is that a variable expression or a constant number? That's just a number, right? When you plug when you have that minus f of a part, right? So this, uh, this is the fundamental theorem. You have the um, the antiderivative with x plugged in minus the antiderivative with a plugged in. That's just going to be a number. And so when you don't have these, what you're saying is it's all possible accumulation functions, meaning starting at any A. So when you don't see anything here, you're talking about a bunch of functions. All the functions, all the accumulation functions starting at any value A. And so since this is just Since this is just a number, we don't write that whole thing out every time. We just, instead, we write, it's just a constant. So we write plus c. So that minus f of a, it's just a constant that, that makes the accumulation start at the right x value a. And when you don't have anything here, it's we're representing all accumulation functions starting at any a. And so that's just going to, that minus f of a, we just shorthand, we write plus c. Okay, so plus c means like all possible minus f of a's, right? So minus f of a for all possible a's. Does that make sense? So this is called a indefinite integral. If it doesn't have limits there, it just means all accumulation functions, meaning starting from any value a. And then what we do for that is right, rather than writing out the minus f of a, we write plus c because it's just a constant. So that's our final answer. 1 over 24, 8 plus x to the fourth to the sixth plus c. All accumulation functions that have that as the rate function, that thing we started with. Any questions on that? So if you saw this answer faster than the whole process we went through, that's the goal. The goal is in the end that you're not you're not going through this first attempt derivative, second attempt derivative, but that you actually see, oh, this is undoing the chain rule. I'm going to need to raise this to the sixth. I'm going to need a one sixth, but then I'm going to have in the derivative. I'm going to have four x cubed, so I need a one fourth. So you just write it down the first time. So that's our goal. If you need to go through this kind of step by step, that's okay. But just always with the goal in mind of that you would just be able to look at this and write this down. That's what we're going for. Someone had a question over here. Um, plus C is just plus C with the addition of x minus C. Is that just like the plus C with the minus C and then plus C with the addition of x minus C? Is that just like the No, what that's about is about the minus F of A. So what, what, that plus C is for, so the fundamental theorem says that the integral function can be rewritten as closed form as f of x minus f of a. So the plus c is is for, say, given any a now. So given any a, 
starting value of accumulation, the minus f of a is our plus c. So that, that's where that comes from. So, so probably in the past, you weren't coming to it in the context of accumulation functions, and that's you got a different impression. Yeah, but it's just, that's what this is. This is this is our accumulation function in closed form, and you have minus the f of a for a starting point of a, but now without anything there, it represents all functions, all accumulation functions starting at any a. So then we add plus c, and that's the minus f of a. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. So here's another one. So why does this one look different? So is it undoing the chain rule? But there's something very different about this compared to the chain rule, which is what? No. What does the chain rule give you? Something what? Times something, right? Something times something. This is something divided by something. So can we make this be like something times something? What would it be? Cosine x times what? <coughs> Sine x to the negative 4, right? Now it looks like chain rule. So again, so what's the idea? You're going to look for, you're looking for this thing. You're looking for, if this is undoing the chain rule, then one of those two is this is this, and that's what we focus on to recover g of f of x. So the g prime f of x, exhibit A, exhibit B. Exhibit A or exhibit B? B. Okay, so looking at exhibit B here, what will our first attempt be? So what do we do? We leave the inside the same, and we do what? The antiderivative of the external function, which would be sine x to the negative 3. You truly raise power. You don't make the power further from 0. You truly add 1 every time, whether it's negative or positive. So we're going to do negative 3, and then we'll need to get a 1 third. Check it. Take the derivative. We get negative 3 times negative 1 third sine x to the negative 4 times cosine x. Exactly the same as what we started with? Yes. That's it. So final answer is negative 1 third sine x to the negative 3 plus c, which is what? Our minus f of a for all a's, right? For all starting points of accumulation a. And plus c is our minus f of a. So there's our closed form version of that original open form accumulation function. Okay, questions on that one? Okay, try this. Make any progress? What's that? So, for, so how about just the first step, just the very first step? Get them multiplied. So what what are they multiplied? Okay, yeah. Right? Very important first step. But then from there you're a little stuck. Dakota, what do you think from here? Okay, fair enough. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, let's just, let's just do this here. Ready? Power is negative one. Raise one to the zero, and then what do we need? For, first of all, what's anything to the zero? One. So there go all our x's, and then we need a one over zero, and what's that? Yeah, you can't divide by zero. Right? So this is kind of like warning, something's wrong, right? You got all kinds of warnings here. There went your x's, and now you're trying to divide by zero. Okay, this is great, right? It's just like this built-in like natural consequence to wrong, okay? So something's different about this power. So what do you think? What function has a derivative of to the negative 1? You remember from your mastery test, you should have had it on your mastery test. Natural log is this special deal where you take the derivative of natural log, you get the 1 over or something to the negative 1. So we got to be on the lookout for that because when we undo it, when we have something to the negative 1, we are going to undo it and so what's going to be our first attempt then? It's Nick, right? All right, so you went you went for the jugular, went for it all. That's awesome. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do it one step at a time. So natural log of two minus nine x. Okay, and so there's a kind of an issue here that we have to talk about. Natural log, if you remember the graph of it, it's only defined for positive values of the argument. So this is just natural l and x. Okay. It's only defined for positive when whatever's going into ln of x, whatever's going into ln, has to be positive for it to be defined. But this function is really defined for all values except that one value of x that makes a zero in the denominator. See that? But it's defined, it's defined for every other value of x. So we have to compensate for that in this natural log. We need this antiderivative to also be defined for all values, not just not just ones that make 2 minus 9x positive, like natural log normally does. So what can we do? We need, we need the argument to always be positive. So how, what, how can we do that? Absolute value, OK? So so again, this rate function is defined for all x, except the one x that makes the denominator 0. Natural log is only defined for when the argument is positive. So we need that argument to always be positive so the do domains of our rate function and our accumulation function match. Does it make sense? So just be on the lookout for that. So in, uh, in your homework, you got to make sure. Now, if your argument is, is by, in essence, always positive anyway, then you don't need the absolute value. Okay? So if, if you always get a positive, like you have like you know, 4 plus x squared. So that's always positive. You wouldn't need to put the absolute value around that. But you can always be safe and always do it. So it will never be wrong to put those absolute value bars on there. Okay. So then we're going to check it. And we're going to get so 1 over 2 minus 9x times. Oh, and so in our first in our first attempt, we could also include the 6, right? We know that there's that factor of 6 in there. So we can include the 6 in the first attempt. So we have 6 over 2 minus 9x times. Derivative of the inside, negative 9. Is it exactly the same? Nope. How is it different? It's negative 9 times too much, right? It's negative 9 times too much. Second attempt then. What will we do to this so that if we took the derivative, we, we wouldn't have that negative 9? Divide by negative 9, right? So if we, if we divide this first attempt by negative 9, in the derivative, that negative 9 would be gone, and we'd have exactly this thing we started with. So that was, is that where the negative 2 thirds came from? So it'd be 6 over negative 9, and that's why Nick said negative 2 thirds. No, this is the only, this is the only function that comes up.
There might be other issues with other functions, but this particular issue, only ln. Yeah. All right, so. And then remember, all possible accumulation functions plus c. All possible accumulation functions. So that, and your homework, so the, the rest of the homework is posted now. It's uh, web work assignments. So there's no more written. You have web work. It's all problems like this for Wednesday. And the two most common things are forgetting the plus C, and then when you have a natural log, forgetting the absolute value. So fair warning, okay? Whenever you take an antiderivative and it's natural log, you have to put the absolute values. And then in some of the web work problems, they'll have the entry box, and then they'll have the plus C there for you, and then you don't, you aren't going to put plus C in the entry box. It's there. But some of them won't have the plus C next to the entry box, and you have to remember to put that in. Okay? Questions on this example? All right. Okay, this one's a little more tricky. See if anyone can get it. See if you can get it. More tricky. The tricky thing with this one is it seems like neither one is a composite function, right? Neither one is kind of like one function plugged into another because we're looking for that g prime f, right? So the way we know is by actually the fact that we have this other thing, right? So we have g prime f times f prime. So by the fact that we have f and f prime, that's going to tell us which is which. So which one of these is the derivative? Which one is the f prime and which is the f? First one is this one's the f, and this is the f prime, right? Which means that g prime f is which? Exhibit A or exhibit B? This is the f, and this is the f prime, exhibit a, right? So this is our g prime f, is that the first one. But then what the heck is g prime? We, so we, we're looking at the f. What is g? How can we conceive this as what's the external function if the internal function is tangent, arctangent? Anyone come up with it? Yeah. To what power? Okay, right, so so what power are we looking at here is what the question. What power is it? To, to what power is this? No, this one. You're talking about the antiderivative. You, I'm not asking for the answer. I'm asking for how do we conceive this to the first power. So you were right. You were right. You were just, you were just talking about the a actual answer. You've got to see this as to the first power. That's, that's a, supposed to be a one. better. There we go. You have to see that as to the first power. Now see if you can do it. If you see that to the first power, then you can do it. So our g prime, that external function, is something to the 1. So our attempt will be? Samantha. Uh-huh. Arctan? Squared. See it? So because when you write something to the first power, you don't usually include it, but you have to conceive that, right? You have to imagine that. And then it's just the power rule. So it's going to be one half of that thing to the second power. Take the derivative. Does it check out? Two times one half. Tangent inverse to the first times derivative. So plus C. Make sense. That one's tricky. Okay, so my my experience helping students with this, they come into my office. My experience is that this step, they, so they, they can make an attempt, but taking the derivative is where they struggle. So we've got to know the chain rule itself if we're gonna have any success at this. So if you're if you struggle with the chain rule, taking the derivative to check it, and you're not doing that right then this is going to go very poorly. This is going to go very bad for you. So you've got to know the chain rule. This whole thing is based on knowing the chain rule and learning to think backwards. See, seeing those answers and seeing what function would give me that, what I started with, if I used the chain rule. So you've got to know the chain rule. So that's why we practice some on Friday, and you should have practiced a bunch in this homework that you just, you're turning in. But if you, if you have deficiency with just the chain rule itself, 
this is going to be a, a struggle, okay? It's going to be rough. So then you know, get up to speed on just the chain rule before you even start working on this. Questions on this one? Okay, so now let's put this all together. So this is putting together lots of things we've learned all semester. So a bacteria in a uh, dish has an initial population of 250 and grows at this rate. 50 e to the point 3 t cells per day. So this is what I want you to, to do. You're going to write two expressions for the function p, which is the population x days after the initial measurement, or we can say t, let's do t, let's say t. All right, hopefully I, I was consistent. So uh, write two expressions for p, the population x days after the initial measurement. Start in open form. So this is now re review from what we've been working on all semester. And then from there, fully simplifies closed form. And then you're going to be applying the new stuff we're learning. So p of x equals what? Is it sec? How'd you do? P of x equals what? 250? Okay. Should be not t but x. And if it's from time 0, we know what a is, right? So, so that initial measurement was at x equals 0. So this is our open form. This is what you got. This is what you should have gotten. Okay. So how are we going to get closed form? How are we going to get closed form? Yeah, so this is a problem just like the ones we've been working on today. We need to get the antiderivative of that. And what will we do? We'll evaluate it at x. And now we have a particular a. So we're going to evaluate it at a and then do with what with those two things? Subtract, right? It'll be the antiderivative evaluated at x minus the antiderivative evaluated at 0. And this 250 is just going to come along for the ride, right? So here's a notation this notation means that thing so so what we can do is you can write down the antiderivative first and then you can write a vertical bar and then uh, your limits and what this means is what we just said evaluate this thing at x evaluate this thing at zero and subtract so it's just a way to have an intermediate step where you're just focused on the antiderivative and not the plugging in part. You don't have to do them both at once. Okay? So is that what you got for the antiderivative? So again, this is like chain rule in that we've got this point 3. So antiderivative of e to the something is just going to be e to that something. But if you took the derivative, you'd multiply by point 3, a point 3 that you don't have. So you need to divide by point 3. So that we saw that today in class. Does that make sense? Any questions on that as the antiderivative? So that's kind of like in terms of undoing the chain rule, that's as easy as they come. Okay, You just have to clean up that point 3 by dividing by point 3. So then we're going to plug in the x and the 0 and subtract. Let's get a slide here. So you have the 250 plus 50 over point 3e to the point 3x minus... That thing was zero plugged in. Okay. How many of you had success at least to this point before I started putting it up? Okay. A lot. Okay, good. All right. Now notice that this is just a number now. So this was kind of like our plus C, right? But we know it's zero plugged in. So we can combine that number with a 250, right? So we've got this expression of X, and then we can combine the 250 minus what we get when we plug zero in with a minus F of A, right? And so then you get this. Again, x. I'm going to change this slide. This is not good. So p of x is the one. So you end up with 166.7, 0 to the point 3x plus 83.3. <laughs> and so we started with our open form. And by taking the antiderivative, using the fundamental theorem, and simplifying, we got our close form. 
So one last task here. I want you to express in three different ways now. You have three different ways to express the population 10 days after the initial measurement. So three different ways to express the population 10 days after the initial measurement. Daniel, what's one of them? Just give me any one you want. So how, what's one way to express the population 10 days after the initial measurement? So he's, he's looking up here. He said 250 plus the integral from 0 to 10 of this. Is that valid? Yep, that's one of them. That's one way to express that. 250 plus integral from 0 to 10, 50 e to the point 3 u du. Okay, what's another way? Shelby. She wants p of 10. Is that valid? Yeah, it's good. p of 10. Writing p of 10 expresses that, that a measurement uh, or that amount of population 10 days after. Last way. One sixty six point seven times e to the third, or point three times zero, point three times ten, which is just e to the third, plus eighty three point three. That's another way to express it. All three of those ways express that value of the population ten days after the initial measurement. Which way are you going to use to actually get the population? The last one, closed form, right? Closed form is our convenient way to actually calculate values of the dependent variable. 